Um, good morning. I'm Dr. Ed Grant, and I'm the chairman of radiology department at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles. Uh, this morning, I'm going to be talking about papillary carcinoma, or cancer of the thyroid at least, and the various ways to image both the primary tumor, but with emphasis on postoperative surveillance and intervention in this group of patients. Good morning. I'm going to be speaking about thyroid cancer and imaging of both the primary tumors and perhaps more importantly, the surveillance of patients who have undergone thyroidectomy for thyroid cancer and how this is employed today, um, how it has changed over the years, and how various imaging techniques have become essential both in the follow-up and intervention on many of these patients as well. When I think in terms of thyroid cancers, they're generally differentiated into two different groups. There are the so-called differentiated cancers, which include papillary carcinoma, which is by far and away the most common of all of the thyroid neoplasms, uh, follicular neoplasms, and Herthel cell neoplasms. And these are generally called neoplasms because cytologically it's impossible to actually know which ones are benign and which ones are malignant. So they actually need to be removed in order to make the diagnosis between benign and malignant. So they're somewhat unusual in that respect. The bad players are the ones below the line, which are the undifferentiated cancers, and these tend to include medullary and anaplastic cancers. And of course, lymphoma may also affect the thyroid as well. There's been a so-called epidemic of thyroid cancer over the last 20 years um, with at least a 2.4-fold increase in detected differentiated thyroid cancers when comparing the statistics from the 70s to those of uh, 2002. Um, I think most authorities would actually agree that this really doesn't imply that there is a true increase in the incidence of thyroid cancer, but in fact, we are finding it in many, many more patients. In the past, it generally took a palpable large nodule to be detected, but with imaging, um, certainly additional nodules are now identified at ultrasound, and also many other imaging studies, such as carotid ultrasound, CT or MR of the spine and neck, um, also identify many, many more thyroid lesions, which then are potential candidates to be biopsied and eventually proven to be uh, cancers. So I think there's really a much greater increased detection um, than there probably is an increase in the actual incidence in the general population. Also, another contributing factor is the now aggressive biopsy of relatively small lesions. And unfortunately, size doesn't really seem to matter in that there is still a relatively high rate of cancers in nodules that are smaller than one centimeter. So really the size doesn't have a great deal of correlation. And some series have actually shown that as many as 25% of these small nodules may harbor cancer. So that, again, it used to be thought that you could biopsy based on the size of the lesion, but that really doesn't seem to be a great way to determine which lesions should be biopsied and which should not. I think it becomes kind of insane, though, as we start to di diagnose more and more cancers in smaller and smaller lesions. Um, also, going along with the fact that there's probably not a true increase in the incidence of cancer in the population is that despite the fact that we are now diagnosing many, many more cancers, there is no significant change in the mortality rate um, for this particular relatively benign cancer. Um, as I mentioned, it's typically a very indolent tumor, um, and there are good statistics showing that there's probably greater than 95 or even 98 percent 10-year survival in patients, in fact, in some cases, without actual intervention or removal of the lesion. It is well known, however, that some cell types do tend to be more aggressive, and I think eventually this is the answer that needs to be found, and that is which of these lesions actually needs to be treated and which can probably be left alone with very little problems going down the line. Some, re some lesions, so-called tall cells, other types, may actually be more aggressive and should be treated um, more aggressively than the routine benign papillary carcinoma. 
Another thing about thyroid cancers is that, remember, they may recur many years after the primary has been removed. Um, in some cases, I think this actually has to do with the fact that the metastatic disease really may have been there all along and may not have been previously detected by imaging techniques. Um, also keep in mind that the current surveillance algorithms are evolving quite rapidly um, with improvements in imaging and certainly the increasing use of biochemical tumor markers, uh, particularly thyroglobulin levels. Now, um, the initial therapy for a patient diagnosed with thyroid cancer is usually complete thyroidectomy. As I mentioned before, follicular neoplasms or Herthel cell neoplasms that have been diagnosed cytologically uh, will often go to hemithyroidectomy, at which point the lesion is removed. Um, it is then looked at to see if there is spread beyond the capsule of the lesion, and if there is, this implies that it's malignant, and usually the patient will be brought back for a completion thyroidectomy. Some places will actually perform a complete uh, thyroidectomy regardless on these neoplasms. Um, at our institution, at least, we tend to go with the hemithyroidectomy first. Um, many of these patients will undergo lymph node dissection at the time of thyroidectomy, and uh, preoperative imaging has shown that as many as 30% of patients who have thyroid cancer will present with positive lymph nodes in the neck at the time of presentation. Uh, many patients will then undergo radioiodide ablation therapy with the idea of essentially eliminating all thyroid tissue in patients who were proven to have cancer. Um, the vast majority of differentiated thyroid cancers will occur in the local or regional areas, basically in the neck. Distant metastases are quite unusual, though they do occur. And again, as I mentioned, the idea of surgery with postoperative radioiodine ablation is that there would essentially be no residual thyroid tissue. Basically, sonographically, there should be no thyroid tissue or no tissue at all in either of the thyroid bed, that area between the trachea and the carotid artery should essentially be empty. Um, and uh, the beauty of having essentially no thyroid tissue is one can then monitor the patients with thyroglobulin levels because again, there should be no thyroid, there should therefore be no thyroglobulin or the level should be very, very low. And this can be used as an excellent way to identify or suggest that there is, in fact, recurrent disease. Um, the, one of the problems, of course, with imaging is that lymph nodes are quite common in normal patients. So the differentiation between metastatic lymph nodes and um, lymph nodes that are just inflammatory or just in, in the normal neck um, can be quite challenging and something that's very important. Um, so the question is, um, who and when do we image and how? Um, there are various techniques. Um, I-131 whole body scanning, I think at one time was kind of the first line of defense. There's the possibility of using CT or MR. Um, more recently, PET, usually now PET-CT, um, may be used to monitor these patients. And it's one of those interesting situations where ultrasound has now become extensively used in the surveillance of patients who have undergone thyroidectomy and has now probably become the primary or first-line imaging technique in monitoring these patients after surgery. Um, what are the criteria for malignancy and how do we confirm it? We'll talk a bit more about that. Um, the frequency of follow-up is, again, not well determined, at least on a scientific basis. And then, of course, there's the question of do we really care? And I think at this point, people are realizing that uh, this disease has become so common now that we're finding it in the general population. Um, it's a very indolent disease. And really, how aggressive do we want to be with what are small recurrences uh, and what would really be the natural history? And I think these are things that need to be worked out over the next couple of years, uh, lest we waste entire uh, large amounts of money in both following and following these patients and finding smaller and smaller lesions that are primaries. Now, the older literature, again, as I mentioned, would have stated that the I-131 whole body scan is probably the primary imaging technique, and I think that that's clearly no longer the case. It was said in the early days that routine scans would be performed at 6 and 12 months after ablation, 
and if the patient had two consecutive negative scans, um, they had a greater than 95% chance of 10-year survival. I think the reality of it is just about everybody who has thyroid cancer, at least differentiated, probably has a greater than 95% chance of 10-year survival, so I'm not sure that's particularly helpful. The drawbacks to the I-131 whole body scan is that it has a relatively low sensitivity for recurrent disease after radioiodide ablation. Um, the anatomic detail is really too poor for surgical planning. Um, it may be negative in de-differentiated tumors that just don't pick up the iodine. And it's really quite well worked out now that ultrasound is far more sensitive for the identification of local recurrence. Uh, one paper quotes ultrasound as being 70% sensitive, whole body scan as 20. Uh, personally, I think ultrasound is probably far greater than 70% sensitive for local recurrence in the neck. Um, the one thing that the iodine can do, the whole body scan can do, of course, is it can detect iodine concentrating distant metastases, and therefore it may be considered in the face of elevated thyroglobulin levels where the neck ultrasound is negative. Again, people might say it could be considered in patients at high risk for recurrence um, or clinical evidence of recurrence. Um, or aggressive tumor histology. Again, as I mentioned, um, this is an examination, however, that really has largely fallen out of favor. CT um, may be useful, and I think its best use in patients with thyroid cancer is in detecting distant metastases. It's probably the best, if not definitely, the best choice for identifying lung disease and monitoring it. Um, generally, you should uh, consider high-resolution CT, as uh, I will show in a moment. Uh, this shows these very miliary lesions far better than routine chest CT. And it may be useful in treatment planning in large tumors that may be invading local structures. It's really a poor choice for the surveillance of routine cervical adenopathy. Um, while it does have reasonable resolution, uh, it really does require IV contrast to optimize the identification of cervical nodes. Um, also, the contrast and anatomic resolution in general is probably less than that of ultrasound or MR. Um, and iodinated contrast media, which are required, um, may be contraindicated in some of these patients. Um, for the nodes themselves, unfortunately, really the only criteria for uh, malignancy is size, and I think it's very well established at this point that it's common to have lymph nodes less than one centimeter that may be positive for malignancy. So also there, of course, is the radiation dose in these patients. Um, these patients may be relatively young, and so in that case it actually may be significant. As mentioned, um, you may see lymph nodes in the neck quite readily with CT. You can see some enlarged nodes here on the right side of the neck. On the sagittal reconstruction, you can see nodes. So again, the CT can pick up the nodes. The problem is it's really not good at differentiating benign from malignant, and the optimum visualization of the nodes requires contrast. The one area where I think the CT really does hold its own, of course, is in the chest. You can see here a routine CT scan, and there's an indication of these innumerable tiny little lesions all over the chest. Um, when you compare that, however, with the high-resolution CT, of course, it's really quite dramatic in this particular woman, who is otherwise well, by the way. This is a woman who has extensive disease in the chest, but clinically, you would never know it. So, uh, again, the actual history of some of these patients may be unusual. Why do some of these patients, a small number of them, go on to have this picture versus the vast, vast majority that never metastasize beyond the neck, if they metastasize at all? One of the other things that both CT and MR can do that ultrasound is not as uh, facile at is the treatment planning in patients with large or very invasive tumors. Certainly ultrasound is of no value in looking at possible bony invasion um, or invasion of the soft tissue structures such as the esophagus or the trachea in this patient with a large anaplastic carcinoma shown here in the neck. So again, for large lesions, extremely large lesions, treatment planning with CT is something that certainly is feasible. Um, MR is also often the uh, other technique of choice. 
Um, when it comes to pulmonary metastases, I don't think there's any question that CT is superior, um, but for cervical imaging, MR should be considered in some patients. Again, ultrasound is cheaper. It has at least equal, if not better, resolution than MR for nodes. Um, that one centimeter rule, again, looking at the size of the nodes may be problematic. Um, however, MR with contrast um, does increase the specificity for metastatic disease versus benign adenopathy. Um, it does require a specific neck coil. I think most radiology departments would have these available. And just like CT, it is good for invasion of surrounding tissues such as trachea or nerves um, when surgical planning is necessary. Um, again, this is usually more applicable to the more aggressive non-differentiated cancers rather than the papillary types. But again, you can get extremely dramatic and excellent images of both primary tumors and lymph node extension. Here you can see a large papillary carcinoma in this young woman on the right. Um, you can see these lymph nodes on both sides of the neck. Um, here with contrast injection, you can see that there is peripheral enhancement um, and uh, lower levels of enhancement centrally, um, typical of, 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 of malignant nodes um, in these patients. Again, very nicely seen with low density centers here after contrast injection. So it does have that ability, probably superior to uh, CT um, in, in this regard. Now, FDG PET, again, as I mentioned, most of these scans are now done as part of PET CT scans. Um, has the advantage of being basically hybrid registered images. So you have the physiology of FDG PET with the excellent anatomy of CT. Um, it, it may be superior to um, white blood cell counting and some of the other imaging techniques um, when this is negative. Um, and it is said that the more de-differentiated tumors become, or metastatic disease becomes, um, the less sensitive the iodine scans will be, but the more sensitive FDG will be. So that's something to keep in mind where PET may actually be a valuable adjunct in imaging these patients. Uh, you do have the problem with false positives with PET scanning and inflammatory processes and in some normals, and of course it cannot be used to direct biopsy. Um, this is just a plain PET scan without the PET CT, PET alone. Um, you can see that there's uptake here in, in some of the nodes in the lower neck or upper thorax. This is a typical picture of a positive PET scan. This, of course, is PET CT. Um, you can see here in the thyroid bed that there is an area of um, increased uptake. Um, you can also see here that you have positive um, adenopathy in the upper mediastinum. So the two of them, of course, give you a much better picture of the metastatic disease and exactly anatomically where the recurrence is located. Um, as I mentioned, you can have false positives. Here's a false positive in a patient with chronic thyroiditis. Uh, Hashimoto's disease will often, uh, because of the inflammatory nature of it, actually cause a diffuse increase in tracer uptake in, in patients who do not have cancer. Um, one of the other um, interesting facets of scanning with PET is kind of the opposite situation in patients in whom PET scanning is undertaken for metastatic disease of another primary, breast, lung, uh, any other primary that's being investigated with PET, you will occasionally find a hot spot in the thyroid. Um, the literature would tell you that these are, uh, do have an increased incidence of cancer. Typically those are referred to ultrasound, sometimes referred as incidentalomas on PET, but these will often be referred to ultrasound for biopsy and as I mentioned, do have a higher incidence of papillary and other carcinomas um, than the general population. So it's probably a good idea for these patients to undergo biopsy. Ultrasound, as I mentioned, has become really the primary technique for both pre-operative imaging, basically identifying and biopsying the original nodule, and for post-thyroidectomy surveillance. It does have the advantages, of course, that it is non-invasive, um, does not require contrast, no radiation, really has excellent, excellent contrast and anatomic resolution in the neck. Um, it's much cheaper than MR and CT, and of course it provides an excellent guide for biopsy. Um, there is literature out there that will tell you that um, ultrasound may actually be positive 
um, when thyroglobulin levels remain negative, and that sometimes we see very tiny nodes that may be positive by biopsy. Um, and again, the surveillance is not well worked out. An excellent uh, review article by Cooper et al. from 2006 suggests that after surgery, follow-up should be performed with ultrasound at 6 and 12 months, and then yearly for three to five years. And again, exactly how, how much you want to stick to this um, is, is really up to, probably up to the philosophy of the referring MDs. But this is something, again, that's always controversial, exactly when is the best time to do surveillance. Given the benign nature or indolent nature of the disease, again, some people may be a little, more, a little bit more conservative about performing follow-up than the um, algorithm proposed here. Um, I believe that the surveillance examination is somewhat more complicated than the typical scan of the thyroid. And in fact, when we see, when we perform thyroid ultrasounds, um, we tend, with, with a positive outcome, with a nodule, uh, we do tend to include the uh, lymph node areas around the neck as we would for a surveillance scan because, again, 30% of patients with papillary carcinoma will actually have nodal disease at the time of presentation. Um, like all other ultrasound examinations, um, these scans are highly operator dependent. There's a relatively longer learning curve, at least I think so, and you really need a technologist or physician who is really dedicated and obsessive compulsive about finding these oftentimes small and multiple nodes within the neck. Obviously requires high resolution transducers. Um, color Doppler, I think, is an essential part of the, or a helpful part of the examination. Um, you need a knowledge of the anatomy of the neck and nodal anatomy of the neck, recurrence patterns, and of course the differentiation of benign versus malignant nodes is very important. Also, again, ultrasound, as I mentioned, is an excellent method for biopsying these potentially positive nodes, although I think biopsy of nodes tends to sometimes be more challenging than biopsying of thyroid nodules themselves. Um, the scan technique is similar to the typical uh, nodule biopsy. The neck is slightly extended. Oftentimes, I have the patient turn their head somewhat away from the transducer, but depending upon the location, it may actually be helpful to have them turn their head toward you. So again, that's variable, um, and I usually see what makes the nodule or the node um, appear most accessible. Um, in patients who have a thick, uh, heavy neck or short neck, or women with large breasts, um, a pillow under the shoulders, not under the head or the neck, but under the shoulders, may help to throw the chin up and therefore make the access much easier for you um, as the person performing the biopsy. Uh, we use the highest um, linear array transducers that will give us adequate pictures. Um, you know, at this point, some of them go up to 18 centimeter or megahertz, rather, but again, the center frequency can often be changed. Um, some patients with big necks, though, the very high resolution probes may actually give you more degraded images than the lower ones. Um, the typical scan, we go from the clavicle bilaterally to the submandibular areas. Um, we evaluate the thyroid bed bilaterally for possible recurrent disease, a common area for recurrent disease. Uh, we take images in the transverse and longitudinal uh, planes of all nodes. Um, important to optimize the grayscale characteristics. You'll see why that's important in a moment. And again, in nodes that are questionable, we may throw color Doppler on there. Absolutely, in our opinion, you must have a technologist or operator worksheet. These patients come back year after year for their, their scans. Just looking at the ultrasound pictures themselves will just drive you crazy. You really need to have a worksheet where the images um, of the nodes and their location and size are put there. We scan them into our packs so that they're part of the record and are easily pulled up for comparison year after year. These patients will come back year after year, and the worksheet is just absolutely essential. Um, as I mentioned, it's important to evaluate the thyroid or surgical bed, that area between and behind the common carotid and the trachea. It should be empty. There should be no residual tissue there. Um, unfortunately, um, it's impossible sonographically to know whether you're dealing with residual tissue from a somewhat botched thyroid surgery, 
Um, we often see patients from outside institutions who come in, or, or worse yet, outside countries, where there is tissue there that actually turns out to be residual thyroid that's not been removed. So that's, that's not uncommon. Unfortunately, it's impossible to differentiate it in most cases from recurrent disease. Typically, the thyroid, uh, residual thyroid tissue will tend to be more hyperechoic and relatively homogeneous. Uh, recurrent disease tends to be relatively hypoechoic. Um, it's important to evaluate the vessels uh, for possible invasion. I think ultrasound is a little less able to do that when it involves the th esophagus or even more so the trachea. Um, the, the big thing though is the surgical bed and the evaluation of the jugular venous chains bilaterally. Any palpable lumps, of course, should be scanned as well. Um, and many of these patients do come in with palpable lumps. They find a little lymph node that suddenly popped up and become paranoid and want to have it evaluated. Um, there are various uh, classifications of the cervical nodes, um, one shown here. Uh, we actually have adapted our worksheet such that the nodal levels are relatively, or not relatively, easily visible on it. Um, most of the nodes will occur in the area of the thyroid bed um, or, and or in the level three or four lymph nodes out here lateral to the carotid and in the area of the jugular vein, either medial to the jugular vein or immediately lateral to it, often impressing on the jugular vein because it's obviously a soft vein and quite compressible by the surrounding nodes. So it's a good idea to give your surgeons as much detail about the location of these lymph nodes. Again, we tend to do level two, level three, level four nodes um, and I usually will also give them the location of the node in relation to the adjacent carotid artery. Is it at the level of the bifurcation? These are usually benign. Um, is it in the mid, mid distal, or proximal one-third, in addition to the nodal level, which may get a little confusing, but um, I think we all work out the communication we need with the surgeons. And again, if you're starting this examination, it's very important to establish a good rapport with your surgeons so that they know exactly what it is you're doing and what you're saying, and you know exactly what it is they want to hear with regard to how to find these lymph nodes. The worst thing you can do is diagnosed lymph, lymphadenopathy, have the patient go back for a lymph node dissection, and then have them come back for their follow-up and look at the scan and say, oh God, there's that node that I saw six months ago and they obviously didn't get it. So very important that the surgeons know very, very well in whatever way you feel best to communicate to them the locations of these enlarged lymph nodes. Now, as I mentioned, the area between the carotid artery and the thyroid, or the trachea rather, should be empty. They should have removed everything that's in there. Here you can see these two hypoechoic areas of recurrent disease. Um, this was biopsy and, and shown to represent recurrent papillary carcinoma. Um, again, the color Doppler may make you feel a little more comfortable about the fact that this is recurrent disease. To me, I don't see a specific pattern with regard to benign versus malignant disease. Again, the malignant disease may be a little bit more vascular, may be a little bit less organized than residual thyroid, but we tend to rely upon the identification of, um, of, the, of the hypoechoic lesions by ultrasound and then progress on to biopsy. Now, adenopathy, I think it's, again, very, very important to differentiate for your referring clinicians the common benign nodules. We have clinicians who absolutely insist, I want to know, what is your thought? Is it benign or is it malignant? You're getting paid for this examination. Commit to it if you can. You can't in every case. So what's benign? Small? Small doesn't help us a whole lot. You see small nodes all the time, but certainly that one centimeter rule that we use on CT or MR in the abdomen is not applicable in the neck. It is absolutely well known that when you say there's a sub-centimeter node, you're saying absolutely nothing because these nodes can commonly harbor malignant disease even though they're less than one centimeter. So if I ever see a resident who says sub-centimeter nodes in the neck, I immediately beat them up because that's just nothing that helps anybody in the neck. It absolutely does not apply. Shape is probably the most important factor of ben benignity or important sign of benignity. Small nodes which are oval or cylindrical in shape are going to probably be benign. Uh, we look for that hyperechoic fatty hyalur region. 
And of course, distal nodes tend to be benign. Just about every patient, every normal subject will have, in some cases, pretty large submandibular nodes in the majority of patients. So luckily, it's very, very unusual to find isolated submandibular nodal involvement from papillary carcinoma. The only time you really see this is when there's extensive adenopathy throughout the neck. It may extend uh, distally, but typically you see these nodes, they're going to be benign. Look for the hyperechoic hilar region, and again, they may be oval or cylindrical, and a little scary in the submandibular area because they can be quite large. Oftentimes, they're bilateral. Now, malignancy is, is considered when we see calcifications. Calcifications, punctate calcifications in lymph nodes um, is, in my opinion, essentially diagnostic of metastatic disease. Likewise, when you see cystic lesions within the nodes, this is very, very uh, ev evident or very, very suggestive of malignant disease. Um, again, well known when nodes become round, when they're involved with malignant disease, they tend to lose that oval or cylindrical shape, um, and round marble-like nodes are also often going to be positive, again, even if they're very small. Some people do ratios between the transverse and AP diameters. I think you can look at these nodes and know pretty well whether it's round or oval or cylindrical. Also, inhomogeneous or diffusely echogenic lymph nodes are also highly suspicious for representing recurrent disease. Here's just a series of very, very tiny, long cylindrical nodes. I don't think anybody would suggest that these are of any concern. This one is also cylindrical, but a little rounder than the others that I just shown, but I don't think anyone would be particularly worried about this. There is a small locus of echogenic hyalur fat. Again, another good sign that this is benign disease. Um, again, another uh, relatively avascular node here, which is nice and cylindrical. I don't think anyone would have an issue with that, even though it does not contain the uh, hoped-for echogenic hylus. Now, I think that can be contrasted with this very bad series of, of findings in the neck. Here you have a young woman with a large mass in the thyroid itself, multiple echogenic foci, typical of the somomatous calcifications of papillary carcinoma. You can see here the carotid artery and jugular vein are sandwiched between the thyroid and this relatively large inhomogeneous lymph node, typical of a patient who at presentation already has metastatic adenopathy. This is a patient where we found a small, very, very round, but quite small node in the supraclavicular area, which by biopsy was proven to represent metastatic disease. Um, some folks have stated that the color can be useful in that benign nodes tend to have a more regular branching pattern from the hyalur region, uh, whereas malignant cervical adenopathy tends to produce a less regular, less orderly pattern. Um, I find that a little difficult to apply uh, routinely. Uh, we often do put color on, but quite honestly, again, um, I tend to go with the shape and grayscale appearance much more than I do the color Doppler appearance. Um, I don't think anyone would have difficulty diagnosing the echogenic foci within this as representing uh, metastatic papillary carcinoma with calcifications, the classic findings of a node with internal calcifications. Here are somewhat more clump-like uh, calcifications in this node, which also, again, was biopsy proven to represent metastatic papillary carcinoma. Um, uh, two of the other features of malignant nodes, this one showing a focus of hypoechoic or anechoic cystic degeneration. This is, again, very highly suspicious for representing metastatic disease. Here's a relatively echogenic lymph node um, sandwiched, again, between the jugular and the carotid artery. Both of these were biopsy proven to represent metastatic disease. Um, again, a small, relatively round node, but I think these calcifications would very, very strongly suggest that this needs to be biopsied and represents metastatic disease. Um, this is a patient with rather advanced disease. Um, you can see the carotid artery here sandwiched between this large bed recurrence 
and the more peripheral adenopathy. Again, both of these masses demonstrate internal calcifications. Not a whole lot of question here, but that this patient has relatively advanced metastatic disease within the neck. Now, as I mentioned, ultrasound guided biopsy is usually uh, ordered before um, intervening or performing the lymph node dissection to confirm the cell cells are present. Um, we get written informed consent. Um, we discuss the usual suspects such as bleeding and infection, although I've really never seen an infection. Uh, bleeding is a real potential possibility with either lymph node or uh, thyroid biopsy, although quite rare. Um, one thing that I have occasionally encountered um, with biopsy of nodes that I, I don't believe I've ever actually done uh, when a patient had the trachea or had the thyroid present is actually puncturing the trachea. Um, again, uh, your, your picture will tend to sort of blur out because the air dissects into the soft tissues of the neck and then the patient will begin coughing up blood, which is not a fun thing to encounter. Uh, I think radiologists get really freaked out by a little bit of blood, but the surgeons, if, if you are that freaked out, will come and laugh at you and say, oh, it's no big deal, it'll go away. So um, it does occur probably because there's no soft tissue between uh, the transducer and the trachea. It becomes more in the line of fire when you're trying to get into some of these lymph nodes that may be difficult in, in difficult locations. But again, it's a self-limiting thing. Uh, reassure the patient, sit them up, reassure yourself. Um, it's really nothing to worry about, and it tends to go away very quickly. Um, in general, just as I do with a thyroid biopsy, I localize the site, I put a mark on the skin, sterilize the area with some betadine. Um, I anesthetize, there are those who don't. Um, I think sticking a needle into a patient's neck multiple times makes me feel better, at least if I believe the skin is anesthetized. We put a transducer cover over the transducer. Typically, we do three passes with a 25-gauge needle. Um, if you're lucky enough to have cytology actually on, uh, on site, which we're not, um, you may have them mounted by the cytologist or mount them yourself. Uh, we always aspirate the fixative into the needle and the syringe, which is very, very important. They spin it down, make a cell button, and um, actually may get cells for slides out of your aspirate. Um, typically, we do thyroglobulin washings, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, although quite honestly, my concern there is really for the cost of that examination, what it adds, but we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. We use a prepared kit for all of our neck biopsies, um, tend to use a 25-gauge needle for the biopsies themselves. Um, I, I know that there's debate about the capillary action of just putting the needle in. Um, I tend to be a big believer in, in suction, so I use the suction gun, the aspiration gun. Gives you very, very good control of the needle and its position. Uh, we do them freehand, um, but I'm a very big believer in, in the suction gun. Um, here's just a real-time image uh, showing a biopsy of the lymph node here adjacent to the carotid and jugular. Um, a lot of, not a lot of, but some uh, clinicians uh, worry about doing these because of the proximity to the carotid and the jugular. Obviously, I don't want to put a needle into either of them. Um, if necessary, because of the location, um, I have gone through the veins on purpose. Remember, veins really don't bleed very much, so it's nothing to worry about. Uh, again, prefer not to put a needle in the jugular, but if you have to, you have to. Um, here's another patient with a very tiny node right here, immediately anterior to the um, carotid bifurcation vessels. Um, best to be careful in these patients. Um, you really don't want to put that needle into the carotid artery, and a lot of times these structures are going to be right next to it. And, and I get a lot of patients uh, who are referred to me and they say, oh, the doctor told me that they didn't want to put a needle next to the carotid, but it's really nothing to worry about. Um, this is a patient who actually had lymphoma with gross adenopathy. Uh, we tend to use slightly larger needles, but again, the 25 usually is sufficient. I've never done core biopsies um, with, uh, between the thyroglobulins and some of the other tests that are now available. We can get a pretty good, um, we do flow cytometry if there's a suspicion of lymphoma. Um, we can get a pretty good diagnosis of lymphoma using flow cytometry without having to resort to core needle biopsies.
Um, I mentioned the problem of the carotid artery. Uh, somehow the tech managed to get this picture, this nice picture of the needle being withdrawn from the carotid. Um, the patient got up off the table. She went home with absolutely no problem. But I must admit, I got a little pale when I saw the needle going right back through the carotid and out the other end. But um, we continued on, um, got our biopsy of the node, and the patient did quite well. I do not like to use 22-gauge needles in patients in whom there are nodes very close to the carotid. Um, I think 22 can be a lot more frightening. Um, 25s, as you can see here, really will do no harm. Best to avoid the carotid, but funny that I got a picture of one of them. Thyroglobulin assays, I think, are worth discussing in that, remember, TG is, thyroglobulin is produced by thyroid tissue, both benign and malignant. Therefore, if you get a positive lymph node aspiration, it is presumptive evidence that there is a metastasis present. So there is literature out there that says that the use of the thyroglobulin assay is actually more sensitive than cytology alone. So we have begun in the last couple of years to do TG assays on all of our nodal biopsies. Personally, I think that this is an expensive test and has an extremely low yield if your cytologist is as good as mine. We have excellent cytology. Um, it's very, very unusual for me to get a negative result in one of these nodes. There is, again, literature saying that in cystic nodes, it may be important. These are pretty unusual, and I think, practically speaking, this might be the only time where I would consider doing thyroglobulin assays, unless I'm pushed by some of my clinicians, and I tend to be. Um, it really doesn't require an additional pass. All you do is a washing of the needle after you're done to get a little bit of the material in saline and then send it over for TG um, assay. You do have to keep it refrigerated. Um, and again, if you have a cystic lesion where theoretically you may not get cells for cytology because you're getting cyst fluid, this may be a reason to use thyroglobulin assay. As I said, it's an expensive examination. Um, on most nodes, I have gotten positive biopsies, and I, I really would wonder if it is something it, it, that is truly of, of, of a great deal of help. Again, in the cystic lesions, I think this is probably a good use for it, but in general adenopathy, um, I don't think I can ever think of a case where the thyroglobulin added anything, although, as I said, there is some literature out there that says that it may. Um, lastly, I'm going to speak about ultrasound-guided node ablation. Remember, we're talking about indolent disease. We are now finding smaller and smaller nodes which are biopsy positive. But again, it's really questionably significant whether surgerizing all these nodes, removing all these nodes, chasing them, is really helping the patient. We have many patients that we've followed over a number of years um, with relatively small nodes or bed disease that have really not changed over several years of follow-up and are being conservatively watched by their clinicians. And everyone is quite happy about that, at least in, in this particular population. Again, it depends upon the clinician and the patient. Many of these patients, however, will have had multiple surgery, radiation, both diffuse and focal. So going back in on these patients time and time again becomes an increasingly unpleasant and difficult operation. For that reason, primarily the people at the Mayo Clinic, but, but now also in many other institutions, people are considering the idea of alcohol node ablation. Again, kind of a, a stopgap measure between doing nothing um, and just watching these lesions and going back to surgery. Um, the ideal patient would have probably between one and three lymph nodes generally small. Once they get much beyond 1.5 or 2 centimeters, they're probably a little too big to start considering alcohol ablation. The procedure is very much like a ultrasound-guided lymph node biopsy. Um, we use a 25-gauge needle. Um, we take a tuberculin, a very small syringe, uh, with 1 cc of 95% ethanol, uh, we instill a lot of local anesthesia into the skin and the soft tissues. This may be a rather uncomfortable examination. Uh, we try to infiltrate the area around the lymph nodes themselves uh, to make them somewhat uh, numb. Um, we begin by advancing the needle to the deepest portion of the node um, and inject 
as small amount of alcohol as possible, a very, very tiny puff. Um, you look with the real-time ultrasound for an echogenic area at the tip of the needle, which of course are the microbubbles that come out of the, that are contained within the alcohol. We then reposition the needle time and time again until the entire lymph node has been treated and we believe we've treated the entire lymph node once the microbubbles outline the entirety of the node and make it echogenic. Um, you can do more than one session. If the nodes don't seem to be getting smaller or if the TG has not gone down, you can bring the patient back. Um, we try to limit the injections to very, very small puffs because it seems to be the extravasation that causes the pain in these patients. Um, at this point, and again, I have to thank the folks from the Mayo Clinic for this because uh, we've never really done one, uh, recurrence in the surgical beds are probably best avoided, again, according to Bill Charbonneau and his group. Um, there is the possibility, these are probably not really uh, well-defined lymph nodes like in the, cer in the cervical lymph node chains, um, and there is a probably higher likelihood of extravasation and there is usually the presence of, there is the presence of the recurrent laryngeal nerve so that you may get tr hopefully transient or even permanent paralysis of the recurrent laryngeal nerve. So we have not done um, surgical bed recurrences, although oftentimes these are small. These would be really ideal lesions to treat, but at this point we've really avoided them. Um, we then follow patients at three and then six month intervals. Um, and again, if the lesion continues to grow, a repeat ablation is possible. Again, because this is such an indolent disease, we tend to be very conservative about continuing to retreat and retreat in these patients. Um, success is somewhat difficult to determine. Um, sometimes these lymph nodes will decrease somewhat. They don't tend to actually just dry up and go away. Um, I'm not sure how useful changes in perfusion by color might be. Um, the big deal here is, of course, looking for a drop in thyroglobulin levels. If the TG levels go down, the serum TG levels go down, that probably tells you quite, quite nicely um, that these patients actually have uh, a successful treatment. Uh, we have had a couple of patients in whom we've treated them where PET shows an absence or decreasing activity after ablation. Also another guide to probable um, success of, of our treatment. Um, again, uh, this is a metastatic node in a patient. You can see the echogenic foci here within it, typical of the somomatous calcifications. Um, the needle is advanced to the more posterior portion, and here you can see the back half of this lesion has now been injected, um, and the echogenic microbubbles are present. Um, start at the back, because if you start at the front, it will obscure the whole node. Um, here you can see that the entire node is now uh, full of these echogenic microbubbles, telling us that we've pretty much treated all parts of the lesion. So um, that's our, our story with um, thyroid cancer and surveillance. Um, as I said, imaging is an essential part of the surveillance process along with TG levels. Um, it's an indolent disease and so I think conservative approach to this is, is very, very important. Um, guided biopsy and, and now we have the possibility even of therapeutic intervention. So certainly imaging and radiology is paying, playing an ever increasing role um, in this group of patients.